As we continue in Romans, we read now from chapter 7, verse 13 to verse 25. Romans 7, 13 to 25. Did that which is good then bring death to me? Paul's talking about the law of God. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For what I do not do, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So it's now no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Your Disappointing Christian life is the normal Christian life. If you seem to be frustrated with yourself and unable to go right, you're in good company. Even if you reflect on your own performance in Christian living, you might ask yourself from time to time, am I a Christian at all? Even when I'm 100% determined and focused, you might say. When I'm fixed in my purpose to serve the Lord and do the right thing, there seems to be some kind of gap between the intention and the performance. It never quite comes up to scratch, even as I see it, never mind how God sees it. This is why, I think, Robert Murray McChain famously said, for every one look at yourself, take ten looks at Christ. And that's biblical. The Bible encourages that. Consider him, the Bible says, who endured such hostility from sinners. Consider Christ. Set your mind on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead. And many, many other similar verses. Another one here, for example. In your hearts, honour Christ the Lord. I look at myself, but I look ten times more often at Christ. That's healthy and biblical and right. Paul himself would encourage that in Romans, because he's taught us already that we're safe in Christ. Since we're justified by faith, he says, you remember that teaching in the early chapters? We're justified by faith. We have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not through what's in us, but through Christ. The wages of sin is death, he said. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So this idea that we focus on Christ and set our thoughts on him, turn to him in our minds, and seek him, remember him, remind ourselves of him. This is a good thought. It's right. But we do also need to examine ourselves, and assess our performance. How holy am I? How zealous in worship and prayer? How determined in the work of the Lord. 
It's necessary, but it's always rather discouraging because it's always a mixed picture. A report that's good in parts, as your teacher maybe said when you're at school. There always seems to be some, something unsatisfactory, an element of falling short. There seem to be two personalities in us as Christians. Two personalities in conflict. And in fact, we'll see here in Romans 7, these two personalities can never reconcile. They can never make peace. They can never come together in agreement. They can never set before themselves a common goal. The two are at war, unremitting and ceaseless war. But is this, Romans seven fourteen to 25, actually Paul's Christian life? Not everybody thought that. Not everybody agrees that it is. You notice that when you move from verse 13 to 14, he transitions to the present tense. I am, he says. Verse 13, I was, 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 now I am, I do, I do not, I do, I do, I agree, now, I who do it, I know, I am, I have, I, I, I. Present tense, people who still do grammar at school will tell you, present tense, first person singular, I am. It seems to be about his present life, his life as a Christian. His life as a mature Christian and an apostle who's writing this letter for us to learn from. Seems to be setting out his experience as a Christian so that we can learn from it. But there have been those who have said that this is not right. Martin Lloyd-Jones, for example, the famous preacher, rightly celebrated and admired. His teaching at this point was that the, 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 the person mentioned here is not a Christian at all. Not at all. He said, we've already seen for example, in chapter 6, that as a Christian, you're no longer enslaved to sin. But this person, verse 14, is sold under sin. Metaphor from the slave market. We saw in chapter 6, sin no longer rules. But here in verse 18, this particular person has no ability to do what's right. So are they a Christian? Is Paul talking about a Christian here? We're set free from sin, we're told in chapter 6. But here we're told that this particular person is captive to the law of sin. Verse 23. We'll see in chapter 8, verse 9, for example, that the Spirit of God lives in us. Chapter 7, verse 18, our chapter this evening, nothing good lives in us. Is this a Christian person at all? Is it Paul the Apostle writing? Seems to be someone, as Martin Lord Jones said, unregenerate. No spiritual life in them. But... Someone who's not a Christian, could they ever say, verse 15, I hate sin. Or verse 16, I agree with the law of God. Or verse 18, I have the desire to do what's right from the heart. Or verse 22, I take pleasure in God's law. Would a non-Christian ever say or think or feel that way? Remember, God's law, before Paul was a Christian, first of all, he was ignorant of the law. He lived in a state of blissful ignorance. He didn't realize what the law actually said. He was alive to God in his own mind, in his own imagination, in his own delusion. But then the law came and he heard what the law actually said. You shall not covet. And he died under conviction of sin. So he didn't delight in the law of God at that point. No non-Christian delights in the law of God. How can they? They fear it. They hate it. They argue against it. They reject it. They mock at it. But this writer here takes pleasure in God's law. And he also says, I serve the law of God with my mind, in verse 25. But the mind of the non-Christian, glancing ahead to chapter 8, verse 7, the mind of the non-Christian, the mind that is set on the flesh, is hostile to God, does not submit to God's law. It cannot. So if the statements here seem rather extreme for a Christian, they also seem rather extreme for a non-Christian. They almost seem to contradict each other. What kind of person is this? 
Well, other people have said, look, Paul's talking about a Christian, but this is what you might think of as a, a carnal Christian, a fleshly Christian, a Christian who's living a substandard Christian life. They haven't yet reached the higher life of victory and success and triumph over sin. There's a higher life waiting for them, but they haven't yet laid hold of it. They're bumping along in second gear when they ought to release that spiritual energy that's in them as a Christian and rise above all sin and leave it behind. Now, I don't know whether... This, I mean, this kind of teaching is still prevalent and that there are many, many preachers and teachers who will speak with great confidence about the victories and successes of the Christian life and make you feel that uh, they've left sin behind and why haven't you left sin behind and sin's not a problem for them at all and it shouldn't be for you. Um, and but it, it used to be taught, I don't know if it still is, it used to be taught in terms of getting out of Romans 7 into Romans 8. Romans 7, they used to say, is the carnal Christian, the lower grade Christian. Romans 8 is the victorious and triumphing Christian. Well, we'll see in Romans 8 that, of course, this isn't quite the case. And in any case, many, many good people have tried to make this switch into a higher Christian life, and they have to admit, in all honesty, it has not worked. How do you jump from the one to the other? How do you upgrade? How do you tune up spiritually in this way? Well, many things were were recommended over the years. Entire consecration to Christ, for example. Lay it all on the altar. Make that entire commitment without reserve. And people have done this over and over again. And they're still the same afterwards. One teacher was holding forth at a youth weekend on this many years ago. My friend, who was a young man at the time, said to him, Is that how you live? And the speaker said to him, To be perfectly honest, I sin every day. Of course you do. Of course you do. Why are you telling the young people it can be different then? Others have held out this idea of a a higher life, but all that that's shown is that they're just complacent. Again, a friend of mine went to see a Pentecostal pastor to discuss this very issue. Now, a lot of us struggle with eating too much, as you can see by looking at us. But this man was very much overweight. And he welcomed my friend to sit opposite him at a coffee table on which was a plate of cakes, which he ate from during their time together, without offering any to my friend. And as he was doing this, he said to my friend, it's easy to be a Christian. It's easy to be a Christian. Well, it is easy if you ignore all the difficult bits, if you ignore all the challenging stuff, like uh, stuff, I guess, in his case, I suppose you'd have to say to do with greed and idolatry, you know, verses along those lines. Yes, it would be easy then to be a Christian, wouldn't it? That line of teaching has to airbrush out the fact the awkward fact that here Paul is talking about himself in the present tense. I am, I am, I am. This is what I do. This is my life now as an apostle, as a mature Christian. But of course, once you brush that out, all kinds of weird interpretations can come in. It's really an open season for academics and people wanting a PhD in New Testament theology. And in the last century or so, There have been many, many, many different explanations of this. Here's one from John Stott in The Bible Speaks Today. He says, The person in Romans 7, verse 14 to the end, is a half-saved person. Well, you don't need a PhD in theology to find that a bit fishy. That's a bit of an emperor's no-clothes moment, I would have thought. A half-saved person. Well, he puts it this way. The Old Testament believers, he said, were halfway Christians. They weren't quite like us. They were born again from the Spirit, but the Spirit never lived in them. They loved God's law, but they couldn't live up to God's law. And that's who Paul's writing about here. But this can't be right. Those Old Testament believers were the same as us. They're the same. They're made of the same stuff as us. 
When you read about Abraham or David or those heroes of the faith, you're reading about believers in the full sense of the word. The only difference is they believed in the promise of Christ to come, and we believe in the finished work of Christ in the past. Their faith looked future. Our, past, our faith looks backwards to what God has already done. That's the only difference. How could you read the Psalms, for example, and as Christians have done all down the centuries, how could you read the Psalms, the personal Psalms of confession, and say, that's my experience, if they weren't the same as us, made of the same stuff as us, the same kind of believers as us. When David fell into sin with Bathsheba, he didn't say, well, I love God's law, but the Spirit doesn't live in me, there's nothing I can do. He said, take not your Holy Spirit from me. So this half-saved person, a valiant attempt perhaps to reconcile the different statements here, but it won't do It's not on. Paul is talking about himself as a mature Christian and he's talking about us as Christians. He's talking about you and me, our experience of the Christian life. And many, many godly men and women have read this and instinctively said, that's me, that's me. For example, when I was a curate, the vicar father-in-law was one of the old-style Plymouth brethren He'd worked as a quarry manager. He'd never been in full-time Christian ministry. He'd never been to Bible college. But as an elder of the local Brethren Assembly, he knew the Bible inside out and upside down. And he was a man of holiness. He was a man of godliness. To such an extent that some of the people in the church got together and asked him if he would run a Bible study for them, which he agreed to do. One time when I visited him, going around him, just, just preparing the study on Romans 7, as it happened, he said, I don't know if that's Paul's experience but certainly my experience. Many others would say the same. Many others whom you'd never dream if you knew them of calling a half-saved Christian or a carnal Christian. These are people who you'd admire. You say, that's what I want to be. I want to be like him. And he says, well, Romans 7 is my life. Romans 7 is my Christian life. So, The other thing to say before we look at the verses in more detail, I think, is this. This is precious to us because it's the only place in the Christian, in the in the New Testament, virtually the only place in the New Testament that tells us that sin is still powerful in our Christian lives. If we didn't have Romans 7, we would have all the teaching on putting sin to death and consider yourself dead to sin and consider yourself alive in Jesus Christ and keep in step with the Spirit and all the uncompromising teaching on the Christian life. And we would come away thinking, well, we ought to be living a sinless life then, a life of sinless perfection. And in a sense, that's true. We ought to be living a life of sinless perfection. We can put sin to death. But Romans 7 tells us it will be an unremitting battle to do so, and it's a battle that you won't always win. If you didn't have Romans 7, you wouldn't know that. You'd read the New Testament and think, well, I'm I'm defective then. Romans 7 says, no, you're not defective. The normal Christian life is going to be disappointing and frustrating at this point. So let's look at the verses in a bit more detail then, finally. Verses 14 to 20. Romans 6, verse 14 to 20, seem to cycle through the same points twice in two sets of three verses. So verse 14 begins, for we know. And then verse 18 begins, for I know. Verse 17 says, it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Verse 20 says, if I do what I do not want, it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. You go through the same argument twice over. Paul repeats himself for emphasis. So in verse 14 and verse 18, he tells us, sin is still powerful in my life. Sin is still powerful. He says, as we mentioned before, that he is sold under sin, verse 14. He's a slave, like somebody bought and sold in the slave market. He says that nothing good lives in his flesh. His old self 
his pre-Christian self is still part of his personality, and he says nothing good is in that old Christian, pre-Christian self. Nothing good is in my flesh. Nothing good is in anybody's flesh. That's looking down at verse 18. But the real self, the new self, the mind, is different. We know that the law is spiritual. I have the desire to do what's right. Sin is still powerful, but it's not the whole story. In verse 15 and 16, in verse 18 and 19, Paul says... I want to do what's good, but I end up doing the opposite. I don't understand myself, he says in verse 15. It's confused. I'm confused. What's going on? Why am I like this? I can't explain myself. I don't understand my own actions. I have a purpose to do something, but I end up doing the opposite thing. Why is that? I can't explain it, he says. And again, he says... In verse 18, at the second half of the verse, I want to do what's right, but I can't. I can't carry it out. I don't seem to do the good things that I want to do. I keep doing the evil things that I don't want to do. There's this gap between intentions and plans and performance. How do you explain it? Paul sets himself out to fulfill a good purpose, and he ends up not fulfilling it. Well, if that sounds like your life... It's Paul's life. It's the Christian life. Later on, in one of his letters, Paul has a good prayer, which I've often thought about. Maybe you'd like to look at it with me. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11. Maybe you could take this this prayer away from this sermon and make it your own prayer. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11. He says to them, we always pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith. All your good plans, all the things you aim to do, all the things you're thinking of doing as a Christian, all the things you set out to do, may God help you to do them all. Because Paul says, my experience too often is I set out to do good things and end up doing bad things. Romans 14 to 20, Romans 7, 14 to 20. Sin is powerful in my life. I choose to do good, but end up doing the opposite. And the third thing he says in this two cycles of verses is this. Sin isn't me anymore, although I'm not without sin. Sin isn't me. It's not the real me. It's not who I am. Verse 17, it's no longer I who do it. Sin lives within me. But it's not the real me. It's not who I am. Verse 20, the same thing. I do what I don't want to do. But it's not me. It's sin living in me. It's not the actual inner self, the true heart, the true inner mind of the Christian. But it's there and it's active and it's powerful. I am not without sin, Paul says. Still, Sin still lives in me and has a piece of me. I'm not ruled by sin anymore, Paul says, like I used to be. Do you remember what it was like to be ruled by sin before you were a Christian? But I'm not free from sin. I'm not at peace with sin, Paul says, like I used to be. Now I'm at war with sin. Two principles, waging war. Glancing ahead to verse 23. There's a conflict, an inner battle. There's a struggle between these two aspects of the personality. The old, fallen, sinful nature of flesh and the new inner self, renewed, eager to do what's good. And maybe it's helpful to you to realize that about yourself as a Christian. You're not a kind of blended person with some good bits and some bad bits. You're actually two different personalities in one person. And they're both extreme. They're both extreme. One is the old flesh, nothing good, nothing good in the flesh, nothing pleasing to God, nothing right, nothing appropriate. 
The other is the new self, the new mind, the new man, the new woman, set on pleasing good, on pleasing God, set on doing good. And Jesus himself spoke about this conflict. Do you remember when he was about to be betrayed? He went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he knew the soldiers would come there and arrest him. And he went to pray. He came back and found the disciples asleep. And he said, can't you watch and pray even for one hour? But he didn't so much want them to pray for him. That would have been nice, I guess. He wanted them to pray for themselves. Watch and pray, he said to them, that you don't fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Your intentions are good. Your thoughts are good. Your inner self is good. But there's something else in you that's going to make you fall unless you pray. So there, just in that sentence of the Lord Jesus Christ, you could say is all the teaching here that Paul elaborates and explains in more detail in Romans 7. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Do you know something about this experience then? Are you aware of this, this, this conflict, this fighting within you? It's the normal Christian life. It seemed to be a little bit of a break, and certainly in our Bible translation at verse 21, they show a new paragraph beginning, verse 21 to 25. And there are four pairs in these verses. Two personalities, as I've already mentioned. Two principles or laws. Two heart cries. And at the end, two masters. Two personalities, two principles, two heart cries, two masters. The two personalities come again in verse 21. When I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. That's the two personalities. Me, in my inner self, in my true self, I want to do the right thing. But it seems so easy to do the wrong thing. And that evil is not outside me, it's close at hand within me. And it is hard to get it right. That reminds me of the words that God said to Cain. Do you remember this in Genesis? Cain was jealous of his brother Abel. The first brothers in the human race. Cain had an insane kind of jealousy, a murderous jealousy, and God warned him. If you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. That's true of all of us in our Christian lives. Sin is there waiting, lurking, and it wants to rule over us and take us over. We've got to overcome it. Two personalities. Paul says, I find this. I find it. He's talking about his own experience at this point. Again, isn't he? He's reflecting on his life and what it feels like to be Paul, what it feels like to be a Christian. And he says, I find this in my own experience. There are two personalities within me. Verse 22 and 23, two principles or two laws. I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. So there's a part of him, the law of my mind, he says, that loves the law of God, delights in it. And there's a part of him that wages war against the law of his mind, another law, the law of sin living in him, in his physical, bodily self, in his members, in his limbs, in his organs, in his flesh and blood. Again, notice Paul sees this in himself. Verse 23, he's talking about his own experience, his own life, what it feels like to be Paul, the apostle. And he says, yes, I have changed now, now that Christ has come, now that I've put my faith in Christ. I've learned to love God's law. That's one of the reasons why we're saying this must be a Christian man. This must be Paul we're talking about here. No non-Christian would say that. No non-Christian would say this is good. I like it. I approve of it. I admire it. I rejoice in it. I love it. That's what Paul says. 
There's a part of me that thinks God's law is wonderful. He would echo the words of the Old Testament, for example, some of the words in Psalm 119. Let me read a, a few of them to you, almost at random. Oh, how I love your law. It's my meditation all the day. Or again. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Or again. I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. Paul says, yes, I can identify with that. I know what he's talking about. I relate to it. But it's not the only thing I think and feel. With my inner self, with my true self, I want to get as much of God's law as I can. There was a time when I didn't really know what it said, as we saw last week. There was a time when I knew only too well what it said, and it convicted me and killed me, as we saw again last week. But now I think it's great, and I just want to keep it. I want to live by it. I want to understand it and put it into practice. But something else within me is fighting all the time. Another law, the law of sin, is waging war. And I suppose we have to ask ourselves, don't we? If we don't, as Christian people, delight in the law of God, if this Bible remains a closed book, and if the preaching sends us to sleep, and so on, who's winning that war then? The inner self or the law of sin? Who's winning? When the desire for the things of God and the desire for the word of God and the desire for the Bible is almost dead. The conflict's going on and you want your inner self, your true self to win and not be defeated as sadly it so often is in all of us. Two personalities, two principles, two heart cries, verse 24, 25. Two cries from the heart. Two ejaculations of emotion, sheer emotion. Wretched man that I am. A cry of pain. A cry of frustration. A cry of longing. I want it to be different than this. I don't want to be in this state of inner turmoil, fighting against this sinful nature. Wretched man that I am. And then the second one there, in verse 25, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Wretched man, where will I find freedom? Where will I find peace? Where will I get relief from all this? I thank God for Jesus Christ. I thank God. Now the first is a cry of his present experience. The second is a cry of future hope. He's not saying Jesus will lift me out of my sin now and put me on a higher plane of Christian living. No, he's saying, I will rise. One day I'll rise with Christ and enter into a new state of existence beyond sin of every kind. One day there'll be a new sinless me. What would a sinless you be like, I wonder? What (laughs) What kind of person would you be if sin wasn't a part of your makeup? Well, we'll find out one day. We'll find out. Present experience and future hope. Sin is present while Paul lives in this body of death. While he's in this physical flesh and blood, he will not be free from sin. Only Christ will deliver him at the resurrection. And it's notable that Paul can deal with all kinds of things. He can deal with all kinds of unpleasant circumstances and difficulties... And he will say, as he says earlier in Romans, we rejoice in our sufferings. You're in prison again, Paul. How do you feel about that? Uh, The money that they promised you hasn't come. How do you feel? The people in the churches are criticizing you uh, and taking you down and talking about you behind your back and slandering you. How do you feel about that, Paul? Uh, You've just been beaten up again. We rejoice, he says, in our sufferings. But when you talk to him about his inner self and this battle with sin, he says, wretched man that I am. I can't believe it. Just want it over. Can't wait till it's finished. He expects to rise with Christ 
and leave all sin behind for good. Here's a hymn that we sometimes sing. If I read to you a verse from it, see if you can recognize it. When I stand before the throne, dressed in beauty, not my own, when your fullness, Lord, I see, when my heart from sin is free, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. That's Robert Murray McChain again, sharing that same longing that Paul expressed here. Get me out of this body of death. Get me out of this life of sin, dwelling in the flesh, fighting against my inner self, my inner being. But he's not out of it while he writes this letter. And he wasn't out of it until he died and went to be with the Lord. And neither will we be, because he says, as he sums up, and this statement really sums up this whole section of his letter, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Two masters, two personalities, two principles, two heart cries, and now two masters. He serves them both. He serves the law of God, and he serves the law of sin. But his mind, his true inner self, his thinking, choosing self, he serves God's law. And he's glad to do so. He delights in it. But with something else to do with his flesh, his body, he serves the law of sin. And that's the self that will be put off at death. So if you're a genuine Christian, these two things will both be at work in you. There will be these two laws operating, these two principles. You will side with one, God willing. You will side with the law of God. But you'll feel them both. You'll feel the law of sin at work in you as well. You will love God's law and you will hate sin. But something in you pulls you the other way all the time and pulls back towards sin and away from God's law. If you had to say in all honesty this evening, look, I'm here in church, but actually I'm not really interested in pleasing God. Honestly, in my heart of hearts. I'd have to suggest to you, you're not yet converted, are you? Nothing in you wants to please God. Nothing likes God's law. Nothing likes obeying and serving God. There's no new principle of life in you. Are you converted? Are you sure? Or, again, you know, we get these things wrong in so many different ways, don't we? Somebody might say, look, I'm pleasing God just fine. I'm pleasing God just fine. Are you really aware of God's law? Do you know what it actually says? Do you know what he requires of us? Have you taken it to heart and felt its impact? Or some of you will say, I expect, look, I am fed up with my failures. I am fed up with all this. I like to think of myself as a success in various areas of life. I like to think that I do the right thing. And I just keep failing with this business of living for God and I'm fed up with it. Take heart. Take heart. You're not the only one. It's the normal Christian life. It's Paul's Christian life. It's the mature Christian life. Take heart and remember to fight. Remember to pray. Jesus said, as I said before, watch and pray that you don't enter into temptation. Remember to fill your mind with the law of God. Remember the good news of Jesus Christ. Right at the beginning of this letter, Paul said, it's the power of God for salvation, didn't he? And it would be powerful in your life as a Christian. The good news. Apply that good news to yourself. Apply it again as you've done before. Say to yourself, am I a sinner? Did Christ die for sinners? What sort of sinners? Nice ones? No, every sort. Do I qualify? Will I bring my sins? Ask yourself these kind of questions. Will I bring my sins to him and rest them on him and trust him? Keep preaching the good news to yourself in this way. Does he promise everyone who trusts him that they are righteous in his sight, righteous in the sight of God, completely righteous. 
A perfect righteousness, an unspoiled righteousness, a righteousness that you can't mess up, a righteousness that does not accurately reflect your low-grade and unsatisfactory Christian living because it's based entirely on the death of Christ, which is perfect and complete. Preach that gospel to yourself again. And then say, if I have Christ, what can I possibly lack? What can I possibly lack for life and godliness? What can I possibly lack in terms of help from above? What can I possibly lack in terms of a father's favor? The presence of the spirit within me, that comes next week. What can I possibly lack in terms of the finished work, the sacrifice of Christ on my behalf? In terms of a savior who's raised, who appears in God's presence for me. What can I lack if I have Christ? So take heart. Yes, in your mind you serve the law of God, with your flesh you serve the law of sin. There's only going to be one winner in that battle, it's not going to be the flesh. Renew your faith in Christ, strengthen yourself in him, and go on with the holy war against sin. Let's pray.